All right, so this is going to be the first ever in the history the Lonely Wrist Podcast. <laughs> the motion and the sound effects are here. We have a sound effects specialist. His name is Justin. Yo! Hello. How's it going? It's going. <laughs> we're just so we're testing out a new mic, so you guys are going to have to be very very patient with us. We're we're new to this thing, so we're not new to watches, but we are new to creating things. Maybe me personally, I don't know about Justin, but we're I, he- I can draw stick figures, and that's about the best thing that I can create. So, <laughs> at least we're showing up. You know, we we're here. We're uh, we're doing the best that we can. So it's the effort that matters. Yeah, yeah. No, I think so. The reason why I think Justin would be great to be on the show. Uh, if, we, if we could call it a show now, but uh, Justin has a huge affinity for micro brands. Um, I'm pretty much really in the big box brands. I don't know the the luxury segment, and, and he's really deep in the micros. <laughs> um, so I kind of want to not only bring him on the platform, uh, but but introduce you to him, spread the awareness, <laughs> and I think. If things work out, I think he's going to be in charge of, of all the content for the micro brands that we that we publish and distribute uh, for The Lonely Wrist. So, so yeah, here he is himself. Well, thanks for having me, everybody. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me talk as well. Uh, you're going to be stuck with me for a little bit if you hang around, but uh, hopefully we can give you some good information. Um, once again, as Blake said, I'm pretty knowledgeable with micro brands. Um, I've owned a couple myself over the years and, um, you know, just done extensive research like anybody who is trying to, uh, you know, get into the watch industry and figure out what they like and love. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty keen when it comes to some of your larger big box store brands and everything, you know, such as Rolex and AP and things like that. Uh, but yeah, I've always kind of found just, a you know, micro brands to be charming, um, for what they do for what they are. So like I said, hopefully I can kind of give you guys some context on that and uh, maybe learn something new today. Yeah, I think so. Um, I'm always curious as to like how you became interested in micro brand watches. Like what, what made you so passionate of just about, cause I, I know a lot about the, the big corporate behemoth brands and there's so many micro brands out there. How do you keep up with all of them, and, and why are you interested in them? Yeah, in the definitely. Well, that's, that's a great question. Um, I'd probably say one of the first times that I really noticed myself, you know, taking a loving for micro brands was that a lot of these smaller companies have the ability to create what they want. Um, they, you know, they don't have as strenuous of, um, I don't know how to say that. They don't have as much. Cut. Over- <laughs> they, they don't have as much oversight. Yeah, right. Maybe. Um, so they kind of have the ability to, you know, work with a smaller team and really create something that's unique, especially for the price point. Um, I can think of the first time that I really started taking a liking for micro brands, though, was I always heard people talk about Rolexes. I love Rolexes. I think that they are a, a great, you know. Great micro brand. Um, yeah, great micro brand. Yeah, yeah. Never heard of Rolex. Um, but no, I mean, they they are the titan in the industry. You know, we wouldn't be where we are today um, with watches if it wasn't for Rolex, you know, pushing that envelope. However, every time that I would ever hear about a Rolex, it would be a normal Submariner or an Oyster Perpetual or something like that, that just never really, I was I was never really interested in it. I thought that it was very cool for what it was, but you changed the color a few times and some of the materials a few times and it just kind of got boring to me. Um, and of course you see the price tag on some of these watches, you know, they're pushing 10 K 15 K 20 K depending on what you're spending. Um, and I know give or take, you can find them for cheaper and pre-owned and things. Um, but it was just never, you know, I never understood that, that mindset of why am I going to buy this watch that looks almost identical to somebody else's and I'm going to spend all this money on it. So when I started noticing micro brands, um, I was like, wow, I can get a lot of watch for my money in something that, you know, might be even released in a limited run of a hundred or 500 or whatever it would be. 
Um, and so I think that, you know, the price for performance of what you get for micro brands is really nice as well. Um, I think that that's one of the big reasons why people turn to them. But, um, you know, once again, it's, they're all unique and they're, they're different in their own ways. And I'm not saying that micro brands are better in any way or, or who's better, but it's just a different market. So I've, I've always said this and some of the people who probably know me probably have heard me say this, but if the luxury brands did did listen to their customers, then there probably wouldn't even be a micro brand space. Like there wouldn't be a community, you know, like if, if, if Rolex gave people what they wanted or <laughs> any other brand, um, then, then yeah, there may no be opportunity. Right. And that's where the, the market shifted. You know, people saw an opportunity to do to do vintage divers, vintage style divers, for example, is, is a huge micro brand kind of kind of uh, design language now. Everybody's designing vintage micros, <laughs> divers. Um, and you've got to remember that a lot of these people that are doing these for micro brands, they're startups, they're smaller companies. They don't have these overheads and all these budgets to put in to the S and D of these, you know, creating these watches. And I mean it. It's really amazing what these people can do with the amount of money and, you know, just having a passion and an effort um, for creating something unique. So I've always kind of liked that idea, too, of, you know, you don't have to be a, a millionaire, billionaire or anything to create something that everybody loves. It's, you know, it can be a passion project that you can do out of your home um, and, you know, still kind of make waves in the market. If it's a good product. I'm curious, what was the, the first micro brand like that caught your attention and, and why? So, I, yeah, I'm probably a little partial. Um, of course, everybody likes what they like, and um, this, you know, this brand's probably been making more waves in the market within recent years. Literally. Uh, yeah, being fairly new, I, I think that they came out in like 2015 or something like that. So fairly new. Um, but I would say that probably the brand that got me on to micro brands is Fair Universal. Um, that's F A R E R. Uh, they're a brand out of you know, the United Kingdom. UK. Uh, yeah, the English brand. English blokes. Um, but a bunch of good guys. They make uh, extremely good watches for what they are. They push the envelope with their colors. Um, they can be a little bold for most people. Um, I think that, you know, they use a lot of blues. I mean, they've got magenta color dials and things of that nature. But um, they're just great for what they are. They they have a good purpose. They have a good story. Um of course, the performance of their watches are fantastic. Most of their movements are either Eta or Salita movements. Um, I personally own a, a model called an Ainsdale. Uh, that was one of my first, you know, big micro brands that I got into uh, in terms of, of a watch. Um, and it has a, a split timer uh, flyback chronograph. And it's, I mean, it's a quartz movement. It's a Swiss made. Uh, but, I mean, you don't see that unless you're spending bukus of money on you know a, another prestigious automatic brand and then you're paying 20 30k for it so for me to kind of come in and you know spend 700 dollars, i feel like i kind of stole it but um you know kind of back to the original question fair is what kind of you know got me into it to begin with i liked their colors i liked um their marketing campaigns and everything and kind of what they stood for and i've you know extensively researched them over the years and watched them grow um yeah so <laughs> he he is so passionate about the brand that he like legit has an instagram i don't know what you're talking about dedicated to his fairer watch <laughs> or at least his wrist that is revving fairer <laughs> yeah yeah i, I think and I, I so i was at uh wind up in san fran and I got an opportunity to meet the guys at Fairer. And I, I was at Chicago, too, and I got to, to see them again. But, um, yeah, they're, they're super great guys. And I got the opportunity to to say, like, hey, my, bu my buddy uh, has, an, has a, fan, a fan account, I guess. <laughs> Is that the most appropriate? I don't know. <laughs> But for your for your brand, and they're like, oh, yeah, we, we know who he is. And then I, I, I FaceTimed him, and sure enough. Showed me to the the man in charge of the booth and, you know, exchanged some smiles and said, hey, <laughs> that I was think, it. I think that he was probably one of the guys in charge because, um, you know, they're a small brand. And it's just not a, a huge team. But 
I think he's one of the founders, I'm not mistaken. I didn't catch his name, but super nice guy. And he remembered me in Chicago. And, you know, I yeah. talked to them. And I, I got a chance to see their whole their whole portfolio of watches. And, yeah, I'm, I'm super impressed with with the watches they're putting out now personally. Um, I was so impressed that I, I did one of the up-and-coming micro-brand, uh, like micro-brands to look out for articles on the website. And I included them. I felt like they were a great mention, a worthy candidate. Definitely. Um, and, and once you get some of their watches in your hands, you know, like there's a lot of, there was a lot of brands there and I got hands on with a, with a lot of pieces and there was very few that kind of stuck out, I think, because, you know, I have a lot of nice watches from the luxury segment and, you know, once you get used to wearing those types of watches, like everything kind of, in my opinion, maybe goes downhill because you know you're you have, pay- a, you have a higher expectation. Yeah, I think I think I think that's it. Um, but you know you're paying more for something, so you expect more, right? That's you right. know necessarily. But you know it, it's in terms of the, the 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 performance, the value, the quality, the finishing. Um, you know, I'm surprised you didn't mention that they're using also uh, Le Jeu de Paris. I think that's how you pronounce it. No, some of their do. some of their movements. Mm-hmm. They're some of their higher end ones that they offer. Yeah, they they love those because of the uh, the power reserve. You know, as a little little kick up. But <laughs> um, I and I was thoroughly impressed. Yeah. So so I'm assuming obviously you said that's your favorite brand, and you told us why. But um, what what else have from that brand has stuck out to you? You know, which from their collection are you are you attracted towards? You know. Yeah. So. Um, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, they really push their watches with a lot of their colors. So the faces on their watches are very unique. Um, even the the cases and a lot of the case styling. Um, they just released one of their cushion style cases. Um, and it's such a cool, just looking case. I've never seen it before. Um, and I love that they're still considered a micro brand. Mind you, one of the larger, more prestigious ones. Uh, because they've been making good headway, but um, they're just very unique in their own way. So I think a lot of what they're doing, they're they're pushing those boundaries, um, you know, with their colors, their their shapes and the sizes, and I think that they really do listen to their customer base as well. Um, there's a lot of people that make recommendations, and um, you know, they're very hands on with their community, and you know, they repost things. Um, so it's a very intimate relationship. Uh, that's also another thing that I, I really enjoy about micro brands and fair uh, in general as well is you have a more intimate relationship, I feel like. Uh, there is not a money counter that is separating you. Uh, <laughs> there are not people that, uh, you know, think that they're all that or, you know, maybe they're in an upper echelon or something like that. You just, you don't really get that. Uh, everybody kind of feels like they're on that same playing field and fair does a really good job of, understanding who their market is and you know kind of including them in that so yeah i mean kind of like i mentioned a little earlier like these these brands wouldn't exist without their customers kind of in, embracing them and kind of or, or them embracing their customers and kind of listening to their customers and and literally taking their their customer feedback and placing it immediately into mm-hmm. uh, a new watch or maybe a, a revision or right. and and they're you know not afraid to revise their watches uh, many of their more popular models, uh, they'll have them kind of a limited run, you know, maybe 750 um, units. Uh, but then they'll, you know, they'll sell out and they'll say, hey, you know, maybe it'll be back in the future. And then sure enough, you know, a year down the line, they're like, hey, we've revised it to the version two and we've changed this on it. Or we've, you know, added a, a color matching date wheel or maybe we're using a new movement that has, you know, a little bit more reliability. So they're really cool about doing stuff like that, about you know, you never stop moving forward when you're releasing a product, no matter how good it is. You always go back to the drawing board. You listen to your community, your, your clients, um, you plan up, you know, what can we do better and how can we make it better? And then you, you push that, you know, revision and whether people think that's tacky or not, I'm sure some people do. They're like, Oh, I don't want to have a version two. I want to have the OG. That's fine. That's more the merrier those watches are still out there on the market that you can purchase pre-owned um, just like anything else, you know, a, a Rolex or anything like that. Um, not to you know, name drop or anything, but you know, there's plenty of people that offer pre-owned. 
So I, I like that aspect of them, though, for sure. So, so you said you have an Ainsdale, which I don't think they have on their catalog anymore, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong. That's correct. But it so is, is that your favorite? Your would, favorite micro brand watch? Is that your favorite? I mean, you own it, so but yeah, I would say so. It's it's probably one of my most favorite watches. Um, I think that it's a fantastic watch for what it is. It is a quartz movement, and like I just heard the crowd go like, "Oh, like it's quartz, no way!" But it's accurate. It is a cheaper priced watch, so it's not hard to obtain for most people. Um, and it's just a really cool tool. Um, I've personally always really been into sports cars, uh, so I kind of enjoy that. I guess if you could kind of sell it as like a racing style watch, um, I love racing style bands on watches. I like things that have chronographs where I can time myself. Um, and the split timer in the Ainsdale uh, is one of the more impressive movements that I've seen on a watch of that that caliber. It's I just I think it's a great watch. So in terms of my favorite, it probably is. Um, of course, I'm biased because I do own it. Um, they do have a few models that I, I really enjoy, but that's always been a, it's, it's had my heart since I first saw it. I know I'm probably going to get a lot of hate for saying this, but court courts typically gets like a bad, like rap sheet, you know, like they get bad street cred. I, I don't necessarily understand it because they're accurate for one, they're cheap to service for two. I mean, you can if your movement is destroyed somehow, you know, you can just swap the movement out and get right back to to mm-hmm. wearing it on your wrist. You know, you don't have to do those full movement strip downs. It doesn't take, right. mo- you know, months for you to get your watch back. So there's, <laughs> and, and especially for newer collectors, like I'm not, you know, right now at the early stage of, of where we're at, you know, I'm not quite sure. We have a lot of people that I know that are deep in collecting that are, are reading and some of the dealers that I, I've worked with, but, um, you know, especially if you're newer to collecting, you know, something that, that I never really considered as, as my collection grew is, is the cost of maintaining that collection, you That's know, right. some, something nobody thinks about if, if I've got, let's just say in, in my specific case, like maybe, I don't know, 85 watches. I don't even know where I'm at anymore. I think <laughs> I lost count around there. I just, some of them are micros, you know, some of them are, are high-end luxury watches uh, from the luxury segment. I don't really know, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean the, the cost of, you know, I've had specific instances where I've had to send watches off and I'm paying, you know, what would be a, a Seiko watch or like a Seiko Presage or, or a Hamilton khaki field or some you know, some good solid watch to just get it serviced, you know, I mean... I could get two Hamilton khaki fields for the cost of one service on, on for example, one of my other other watches, you know. And, and you're spending it on getting your pusher replaced or something, you know, instead of getting a brand new watch. So. Yeah, yeah. So as, I mean, again, I know they get a bad, I guess, bad, bad rap, you know. But especially if you're new, you know, into collecting and just trying to, to get a, an affordable watch. I mean, there's there's great watches out there that you can get for three fifty, four hundred dollars that are you know manual winding or even automatic. That mm-hmm. you know, um, even some Seikos. You know, I mean, those are pretty cheap to get serviced. But um, Seikos are fantastic. They've yeah, been around for so long for a reason, and that's why you see them on so many people's wrists. Is they offer a good product for what they cost. You know, sure, you don't have the the Swiss made title and, you know, all these extravagant things that, you know, you expect from more expensive brands. However, they're still, um, you know, regulated very precisely. They're using workhorse movements that can last years. If you take care of them, they're easily serviceable. Um, and then kind of back onto what you were saying, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up the, you know, price of servicing because a lot of these micro brands, you know, the, the heart that's beating inside of them, some of them, you know, they're really only having, uh, you know, the Eddas and the Salidas and the Miotas of uh, movements and things like that nature. Uh, there's not a whole lot that really do in-house movements. Mind you, there are a couple out there, and I won't name drop any and, you know, talk down or talk up anybody. Um, but it just goes to show that you can still make a great watch and have a, you know, a pretty, 
I don't know how to put that, but a, a watch movement that's been regularly commonly used in many different watches, but still have a good product. Um, that's one of the things that draws me into a lot of micro brands as well is I don't want to have to pay an arm and a leg when, you know, I, I oopsie daisy my watch and then, you know, what am I going to do? I, I can't, I can't repair it if the, the watch is too much money. Uh, you know, for somebody who's very price conscious, that's an immediate, you know, thing that comes to mind for me is how can I protect my assets, but still not feel like I'm going into debt doing it. Um, and I think that a lot of micro brands offer me that flexibility um, to, you know, have a, a good product. And yeah, sure, you know, maybe the, the movement inside is a is an ETA movement. Um, so what? You know, it's a great movement. It's been around for a long time. And it's reliable. Uh, I, I, yep, and I can get it serviced anywhere. I don't, I don't have to go to a specific person to, you know, do anything crazy to it. And it's, it is what it is. That, that's the other side that I think people... I mean, I hope they consider, but I, I don't know a lot of people that talk about it, but, um, you know, I worked for a watch dealer for, for a while and, you know, everybody was talking about in-house, 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 in-house. Does it have an in-house movement? Does it, da, 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 da. You know, um, the, the downside to that, that I would always kind of, you know, push back on is like, what are you going to use a watch for? You know, obviously if you... If you want a daily driving watch, like there's there's specific instances where I have purchased older watches because they didn't have from from luxury brands, mind you, because they didn't have an in-house movement mm -hmm. because I want to wear it every day and I, I want that peace of mind that I can take it anywhere, you know, my local watch shop, have it serviced in a matter of days and back on my wrist and not have to to send it off to you know this brand or that brand because you know the watchmaker knows how to work on it he has access to the parts you know he's got i'm sure they've got diagrams you know for tearing these things down you know that etta and salita that they provide i mean i, I know in certain instances in some cases if i'm not mistaken that some of these parts are even interchangeable you know um from etta to salita so um, so yeah, just considering that, you know, especially for a daily driver, you know, having something that you can get serviced, it's, it's like if you were driving a Ferrari, you know, daily driving a Ferrari and you have to pay that Ferrari maintenance, you know, more power to you. I'm glad you can do that. You know, not, right. not, not a lot of us can do that. Um, and so, and so that's one thing, you know, especially with the instance I, I do drive a, a foreign a foreign German car and you know <laughs> the brakes just to get the brakes replaced was like two thousand dollars you know you can't resurface the brakes you know you have to change the calipers yeah. and the pads and all that and you know it, it was like a two thousand dollar job because but if I had a if I had a Honda or like a Toyota or something I could have gotten a full brake job for like three or four hundred and they could resurface those things you know so right. so just considering those things in the bigger picture of of your collection and your journey i mean we're not here to to tell you what's right or wrong you know we're here to to just talk about what we know and what we think about and what we consider and hopefully you know our our, our advice here you know can can give you a new picture or an, a new thought that maybe you didn't have yeah i definitely agree and um touching back on the you know in-house movements uh that blake was just mentioning I kind of look at that stuff as almost like creating music. Um, let's say, you know, specifically electronic music. There are many producers that will use samples that will put them together, stretch them, edit them, and they'll create a song. Whenever that song comes out, it is a finished product. You still view it as a finished product song. It's, it's a completely original because nobody's ever done it before. But a lot of those samples that they use you've heard many times in other songs. That's kind of how micro brands are essentially pushing themselves in the field. They're taking, you know, these movements and these pieces and they're creating something that is still unique and different and it's still a, a final, you know, polished product, um, but they're using pieces of things like that that you can kind of create something whole. Um, and mind you, a lot of these people don't have the budgets and the teams to just go back to the drawing boards and say, hey guys, we're going to make an in-house movement and we're going to spend years 
you know, and millions and millions. Yep. You know, researching and developing and going back to the factory and they, they don't have that. They have an idea a passion. They want to put it to the test, start creating something. And their best way of doing that is using the pieces and parts that are available to do so with. Um, and that's kind of how I view that. There's nothing wrong with either, you know, have, having, you know, parts that you put in that are, you know, cheaper and more accessible compared to having in-house. Um, it's, just, it's just different. Um, and same thing for car people. You know, you've got people that love to tinker with cars and they can interchange parts in and out. And it doesn't matter if a part sometimes is from, you know, whoever it is, if it's this super prestigious, I mean, as long as it gets the job done and, and you have that passion and, you know, you, you love what, you get and create then i don't see a problem with it i'm probably gonna get a lot of hate for saying this as well but i'd rather i'd rather not pay for the movement development and and all of that and save money or even even people talk about oh for that price you should be getting in-house yeah i'd rather have an off-the-shelf movement that is regulated, certified for accuracy, cost, whatever, um, and finished and decorated like like crazy, and that extra budget go towards the case, the dial, the finishing. I mean, whatever design elements. Um, I mean, particularly the dial or the bracelet, I'd, I'd rather see that money go to, you know, those things, you know, so I mean, I'd rather have a nice, a nice finish put together piece versus having like a shitty, a shitty finished <laughs> watch with like an amazing movement, you know, yeah. like, I mean, let's just say it the way it is, you know, so I'd rather have that, 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 that reliable, affordable, maintainable heart and all of the finishing decoration i'd rather see that because that's stuff that i actually see that's right you know and that's stuff that i feel that's stuff that i i look at at a glimpse you know and not even talking about extra exhibition exhibition case facts because that's a whole probably rant that we could go down <laughs> you know you you only see that you know unless you take your watch off and show it but it's, it's not something that i i particularly care about it's cool but I mean, that's really the only opportunity you get to see the movement, you know, if, if you have an exhibition case back or a steel case back. I mean, again, it's, it's, it's like it's not like you have an exhibition case back for or an exhibition hood, should I say, for your car, you know, like <laughs> some people do. Some people don't have hoods. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. If you're Dom from Fast and the Furious and that thing sticks out, <laughs> sticks out of the front hood or whatever, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, whatever it is. I don't even know. I don't know cars, but. Um, to me, it's just silly, you know, I, I, I'd rather have better finishing. I mean, hate on me for it. I'd rather have a better finished watch than, than in-house caliber for the same money. Yeah, I can definitely agree. And, you know, drawing back to the micro brand market, you know, th there's many different ways that people do things. Not everybody uses, uh, workhorse movements. You know, there are some in-house and some more reputable, um, people and things of that nature, um, and they do great jobs with what they offer for the money. Um, but I agree with Blake entirely. Um, you know, it's always been this thing where people are like, oh, in-house movements. It's It's got to be something that they make in-house for it to be prestigious. I don't agree with that. I think as long as you have a very well-finished watch, it is a very reliable movement. It is something that is, um, you know, you're able to repair it. Um, you can still have a great product um, and enjoy it, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm clearly an example of, of that, you know, testament of, you know, I don't have to spend bukus, you know, thousands of dollars to really find something that I really enjoy. So Yeah, and another kind of uh, one I kind of want to call out, um, and we, we've talked, I mean, we're, we're not, we're not trying to show any affinity towards any micro brands. But in this specific case, I can kind of call out like Baltic. Um, I recently acquired the GMT from them also at wind up. I just saw it, you know, Justin had turned me on to the brand and I, I started peeking and checking them out. And I remember, you know, him saying, Hey, like this is a cool brand and I had not heard too much about them. So when I saw the opportunity to, 
to get my hands on one of their watches and you know I, I particularly like GMTs personally it's just a complication that that I, I can use pretty regularly and reliably because I have friends and colleagues that, that work all, all corners of the world so you travel quite a lot too yeah I, I think I travel enough to, to, to warrant having one um, but but once I got my hands on it you know you could tell it's a, it a decent watch for the money you know and you know, some of the things they're using a Swiss movement in that guy, and uh, the dial is absolutely beautiful. Um, even the bezel, you know, like if you consider, there's not there's not a lot of of watches out there that are using like sapphire bezels. You know, like there's some big boys like the Fifty Fathoms, and and you know even the the Longines. Um, shit was uh the longines uh i can't ultra ultra cron it took me a while to come <laughs> to, com, to come back to that yeah. it's um, light, isn't it? uh no that's that's also sapphire, sapphire if, I'm not, okay. if i'm not mistaken um but but yeah i mean there's there's not too many that are using sapphire yeah. and you know the bezel's fully loomed it's got great loom it's got a solid movement um it's reliable i mean I can't tell you how many times that's happened to me where I've, I've went down the rabbit hole of really enjoying how a watch looks and the reputation that it has. And I'm looking over the spec sheet and it's like, oh, this is not a sapphire, <laughs> you know, dial you know, on the top of the dial. And for me personally, who's somebody who bumps and, you know, bruises uh, my wrist, you know, quite often, I, I walk into a doorway uh Literally. Um, so that's something that I'm like, man, I'd, I'd really enjoy having that on this watch if it if it did have, you know, a sapphire glass on top. Um, and you'd be surprised at how many people, you know, by choice, don't choose to do that as well. Not that one is better than the other. Um, I personally have had my fair share of wearing watches and, you know, scratching them and then thinking that I've ruined the whole watch and it makes me not want to wear it. And for me, that's kind of a fail safe and Every every manufacturer is different, but yeah, I mean, you, there's a, you know quite a bit of micro brands that have understood that up front is people want you know kind of the best thing that they can get for their money for it to be unique but still be built well, and most of them do have you know sapphire um, tops on, which is pretty cool. I, I like seeing that sort of stuff. As a Speedmaster owner, you know, of a Hesselite owner, I, I've learned to to let go sometimes, <laughs> you know, because I have. Poly watch, of course, naturally. I think any acrylic crystal owning watch collector, if that, I don't know. If, <laughs> I think in. Say that five times fast. Yeah, I know. Jeez. <laughs> um, it's something that you have in, in your, your cupboard. Do, do we even say cupboards in America? I don't, you know. Drawer. I mean? Drawer. <laughs> your, your, your bedroom vanity, you know. Um, nightstand. Yeah, yeah nightstand, <laughs> whatever. Um, it's something that we all have, and you know, obviously, anytime you use that, you know, you're, you know, you're there's an, it's an abrasive, you know, paste. So you're you're taking off some some material, you know, to to cover that, you know, to get rid of, of those scratches. So, um, so yeah, there are ways, you know, that you can clean. You know, like for example, I I was working and I got a scratch on my sapphire, what I thought was a scratch on my sapphire. Um, and it was just a huge gash and i was like what the hell this is a sapphire like they say only a diamond can scratch a sapphire and I, i'm not a, a, a expert on materials here <laughs> you're not gonna go around trying to scratch things <laughs> i'm not gonna go get diamonds to scratch my sapphires um but but yeah it was a piece of glass that scratched it and there was a huge gash in it and i was, I was literally like about to cry broken yeah. yeah i mean it was a panerai it was not not a cheap watch yeah. or anything but you spend all this money and you're like man i, I thought i was going to get something that would just stand the test of time and some of those things don't you know well funny break down funny enough like i thought i had to send it off i showed some of my friends you know some of the friends in the industry and they're like oh, i'll just send it you know back to the watchmaker they'll replace the sapphire or whatever cool so I actually went home and and took Poly Watch to it, <laughs> and it took it out. Nice. So I I I mean you can still see the gash from where, because the way it, it hit, like it hit the side of the bezel and it also obviously made contact with the the sapphire, but it literally was some type of like transfer of wow. some something. Um, but. But sure enough, Poly Watch saved me then, and uh, now it looks like brand new. And some, sometimes too, I know this is a weird one, but I get a lot of watches 
that have like anti-reflective coatings like on the top and to me sometimes i don't know but those things can get scratched you know and 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 in that case i could also use poly watch to to take it off so i have a few watches that i plan to poly watch here um (laughs) to get rid of those ar 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 scratches that are are just super annoying to me you know that's cool man um i didn't know that happened to you with that yeah that stinks yeah no, Bro, i bet I, you were about to cry <laughs> i was i was i i don't even want to talk about how it happened to be honest because i was just being an idiot yeah and you're the only one that notices to this day still like if you were walking down the street nobody would be like oh like you've it, got a you've got a gash going down i mean it, gonna look like it was huge and in the future video the future podcast we're gonna do the video sides of things and and out i would have superimposed it here <laughs> the picture um but no, no, it, it happened, it's real, and I was sad, you know, I was scared, um, I wouldn't say scared, but I just was like, shit, you know, this is a, an expensive mistake, yep. you know, um, but I don't want to get too sidetracked here, um, so I, I guess I'm starting to notice kind of a trend in micro brands, um, what do you think about some of these emerging trends? And micro brands and, and one that I know, for example, I mean, I kind of referenced it a little earlier, but everybody is doing vintage 60s and 70s inspired divers watches. Mm-hmm. Um, and those things are just blowing up. You know, everybody's kind of paying homage to the the early generations of watch collecting. When, yeah. You know, so I, I don't know if you particularly are fond of those trends or what do you think? I mean, do you think it's just a trend? Do you think it's something that's going to stay around? Um, I think that you'll always see it come back around. And I think that the design of a lot of these watches will oftentimes tie into fashion trends. Um, you see that with fashion. You see that with uh, the design of homes. You see that with interiors of businesses. Uh, I mean, even down to the paint colors in your home. So I think that, you know, it's a cool thing that people are becoming a little more daring to push the envelope, um, you know, and, and to, to make something that they've never, never made before. Uh, and, you know, there, there's so many of these, you know, vintage style watches and things that you're talking about, 60s and 70s. There's so many of these types of watches that have already been released over the years. I think it's a pretty cool thing when micro brands can kind of put their own spin on it um, and do it really well. Uh, you know, we were just talking about this the other day. The, what is it, the Seafarer, uh, the 300? Um, the Seafarer? Seafarer, is that what it's called? Which brand? Is Cut that. Omega. <laughs> oh, Oh, he's talking about the Seamaster. Seamaster. I'm sorry. I don't know why I said Seafarer. I'm thinking of Fairer. He, he's stuck on Fairer. Yeah. Like, we're not going to cut that. I don't care. <laughs> this is raw. This is uncut. Seamaster. Excuse me. I know my watches. Uh, no, they have a, the Seamaster, um, the vintage one. Seamaster 300 Heritage. Yeah, Heritage. There you go. That's the word I'm thinking of. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to look at dummy to all these people. No. Everybody's like, I'm cutting the podcast <laughs> yeah, right I now. I don't trust this guy. <laughs> this, this is why I got him on for micro brands, guys. <laughs> But no, I mean, that's a, that's a fantastic um, looking watch. And I've seen a couple watches that kind of resemble that within the micro brand um, market. And it, it made me do a double take when I've seen some of these brands try and do something like that, like that Omega is doing. And I'm like, man, this is, a, this is an expensive watch. It's a very nice watch. Uh, and then, you know, I'm taking a look at some of these other micro brands and I'm like, they're doing a pretty good job of making something that's still along that same genre but it's different in its own way um so but i mean back to your original question is i think that that will always be a trend is you'll see fashion trends and design trends that will stay for a little bit five years ten years and then they'll move on to create something different um but i think that it's really cool you know i i see it as if you're invited to a party you can kind of hang out how you want and do what you want to have fun. And the more people that are at the party, then the more fun it is. So not everybody does it right, you know, but the people that do, the brands that do, they can hang around. I notice um, some of the brands now specifically, even the luxury segment, like 
they do this really well, but they'll dig into their archives, especially ones that have a lot of heritage. Definitely. And they'll be like, hey, like here's some designs from the 60s yeah. that were super hot or maybe not so hot then or whatever, right? And then they have like a modern collection, like a modern side to their collection. And, you know, a brand that immediately comes to mind in this case is like Zenith, you know? Um, they have their Defy collection, which is just ultra modern experimenting with materials lines and blocky designs and yeah it. like harsh edge case yeah. cases uh experimental with materials you know you're getting some skeletons there um and then you go back and to look into some of well even some of the other defy pieces i mean that are are just very classic some of the the chrono master originals and I mean, that is, you know, essentially a, a modern cased up version of a, of a vintage design watch, yeah. vintage designed watch, should I say. Um, but they have no middle ground, you know, like they have their ultra modern or their ultra vintage collection. Yep. And I like that. I respect that. Um, it's also cool when people push the boundaries and don't try and copy trends. Um, you know, I feel like that falls short a lot of times when people do something that's very daring um and it can be very polarizing uh to me i really respect it you know they will eventually find a market for something that some people just aren't interested in there will be people that will adopt a fashion trend or a design and they'll love it um you know i'm, I'm personally wearing a very polarizing watch currently um that most people would be like wow like that's really interesting and yeah, sure, it's it's not for everybody. But when I look at this watch, I know how the design, you know, was originally created. I know the whole story to it. It's It was a passion project watch from somebody who was very, you know, technical with watches that wanted to create something unique. And I think that they achieved it very well. Um, and it's, you know, it's a lovely watch. I, you know... I think that sometimes people can kind of look at it and say, hey, that's a that's a cool watch, man. And I'm not sure if they're thinking like, wow, that's interesting or if they're really telling me it's cool. But um, I personally think it's cool. And, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, not everybody is going to agree with the same designs and trends. And that's OK. You you can tell everybody what, what watch it is you're wearing yeah. now that you've hyped it up. Like we're not I don't want to withhold anything. I think a part of the early stage of of our brand you know i think our startup whatever you want to call it like our, our passion project is being transparent you know with everybody yeah. and and you know creating a new experience um and like i said this being our first podcast like i i don't want you guys to feel like we're ever being um dishonest or or not genuine or withholding you know i feel like that's also being dishonest so <laughs> Just tell them what it is. Yeah. I mean, you're wearing it also on a, on a Tiffany baby blue. <laughs> I'm sure I'm going to get sued for just saying the word Tiffany. <laughs> but, you know, there are some females out there named Tiffany. Cut so, that. yeah. <laughs> Not uh, the strap. <laughs> yeah. But, but no, you can say. Yeah, right? it's a – so it's a Codex spiral. Um, I was on – I think it was Watch Finder – something I, I don't recall the website that i was on but i was researching brands one day uh, specifically micro brands and i just wanted to see what was out there and um there's many you know many many out there categorized from a to z and i was kind of going through the list uh and this brand is called codec c-o-d-e-k uh and they actually no longer make watches which is really sad uh because i think that they were really onto something unique um but it's called a codec spiral uh, this one is the Opaline White, or Opaline, however you want to pronounce that. Uh, I believe there were 50 of these, 50 of these made, excuse me, 100. Um, and then they have a blue with like a orange uh, second indice. Um, there were only 200 of them made. So there's a total of 300 out there in circulation in the world. Um, it's a fantastic watch. It's got an asymmetrical case. Uh, it almost looks like... And, you know, we can maybe superimpose this if we put some video on them eventually. You yeah. know, you'll, you'll have to look this up. Um, almost looks like a little fossil or something, like a little Pokemon. Like, it's it's got a rounded side on it. And then where the crown comes out, it kind of has these little jagged 
edges to it to make it almost a full it's kind of a semi-circle look but um it's a beautiful dial uh, all of the indices they almost look like they spiral into each other um so from your your three o'clock and your nine o'clock indices being you know the, the largest of the lines as soon as you start it like you know um one two four five six they're all a little smaller and they grow into each other so you get this really cool spiral effect um, and then in the middle, it has um, kind of like frequency, frequency waves, um, like these little, just little lines that are um, kind of indented to give you some texture into the, the dial. Um, alpha hands, uh, so, you know, they're kind of skeletonized, skeletonized, can't say that. Skeletonized. Like new, <laughs> yeah, skeletonized. New, new thing, take, that's, take, take listen. That's right. Um, but no, like I said, it's just a really unique watch. It's got an ETA 2824. Uh, inside of it um, and it is a modified 2824 and what I mean by that is a 2824 normally has a date will this does not have a date will so the creator of this watch even intended to take that little bit of extra effort to say I'm going to take the date will out so you don't have a ghost click whenever you're changing your time on this watch ghost position ghost position that's right so there is no ghost position. Whenever you go to pull this out and you're changing your time and everything, normally you'd, you'd feel that date will click. There is none of that. So he kind of took something that was, you know, a, a, a workhorse movement and even did something a little further to make it more unique. Um, but That's, once again, yeah, it's just a cool watch. I enjoy it. Some people don't. But it, it's definitely, it's, it's all based off of the inner workings of how a watch is supposed to work so the whole face of it is meant to resemble a hairspring that's inside of a watch oh so if you if you look at it you can kind of see like how it spirals into itself to kind of look like it goes you know like a back and forth and then the frequency of it um to give you kind of like that heartbeat sort of yeah. look to it but of course you wouldn't know this if i didn't tell you right so right. if you just walked up to me on the street you're like oh that's a that's an interesting looking watch. I love the story of it. I love the the passion that was put into it. I had no idea yep. like that there was that. I mean, every every brand has a story, you know. Obviously, you know some type of founding founding vision here, you know, or else there wouldn't wouldn't really exist. But I, I never knew that. And whenever you told me about it, like I didn't really like absorb it. You know, like I just saw you. So you wear... weren't listening the whole time. No, I'm just kidding. No, I mean I'm listening now. <laughs> I wasn't then, but but no, I mean there's just every brand has a cool story, and yeah. I never knew that it was limited. I mean it's a it's a watch that personally I, I it's very eccentric. I yep, think I, I just I I couldn't. You don't you don't know if it's dressy or if it's like sporty or like it's just like this weird. It's... Like you can kind of dress it up. But... I don't know. I, I have eccentric watches, but that's one. I don't know. I mean, it just the the case is a little odd, mm -hmm. and I think I think we're we're gonna do everybody a favor here and just do some audio and just put some silly like logo or something for YouTube, <laughs> um, and maybe a few few talkovers um, and some waveforms to to kind of spice this thing up. <laughs> um, but no, it's something I never knew, and it, it is a cool watch. I think, um, and I mean, definitely, you know. Going in there and modifying the movement, and I mean, having a ghost position is kind of annoying. Yeah, you know, like I have some is. watches that that have them, and it just seems like lazy or sloppy or I don't, I don't know. But I mean, I, 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 there has to be like a, a cost consideration right. that right. goes into like production. Like, hey, if this is going to be a cheaper watch, and in my case, these watches are three or four hundred dollars. Um, some of my micro brands, like they're, you know, they're not going to have a, they're not going to fix that. They're not going to go out of their way. They're just yeah. going to slap the movement in there. Yeah. And I mean, I'll, I'll go ahead and, you know, throw some prices down and uh, hopefully that's okay. I mean, these guys aren't in business anymore, but, um, this watch, you know, it retailed for $660, um, for the movement and the, the, the price for everything that you get is just phenomenal, which is one of the reasons why I wanted it. It was unique. It's a Sapphire crystal. Um, it's a 916L uh, stainless steel 316. Excuse me. Oh, sorry. You, I, see, we're not material. <laughs> we're not material guys. Yeah, not material guys. Yeah, I know what I'm talking about. I promise you. Sometimes my mind uh, goes too quick. The 316L. Um, it's got you know polishing on it. It's got brush on it. Um, 
it's an exhibition case back so you can see the movement it's a modified movement um i mean it, it's just it's a killer watch it's about a second fast a day um so it's really regulated it's a really nice watch and it came with a, a horween leather strap and if you guys don't know what horween is that's a, a leathery company out of chicago um, they've been doing it for years long time and they make really great um you know material leather so whenever you hear horween leather on a watch strap you're like oh man i'm getting some of the best of the best it's really good stuff so all of that retailed for 660 dollars for it to also be a limited run to me i was like dude like take my money like that's a cool watch yeah and to this day i mean i still have people compliment me on it um you know the the creator of this thing the owner i don't know ultimately why they fell out of business um but i think it was a passion project for a little bit and then he probably wanted to do something else and you know sold out whatever else they had and said see you later and i mean to an extent i kind of respect that like some people will come in to play something and then they're like i don't want to play this anymore and then they leave and it's okay if you make a good product and you kind of have something to show for that so I mean, yeah, you have the watch on your wrist. It's not like it's a Kickstarter. Right, where, right. Like, yeah. you, you dump money into a Kickstarter and then... And never saw the, the day of light. Yeah, you never right. have the watch on your wrist. Yeah. I mean, that, that has happened before. It's not it's not common, but yeah. <laughs> um, for the sake of controversy here, we probably should have a little bit of an argument on our, on our podcast or whatever we're calling this. Um, but if somebody was new to collecting watches... You would probably recommend them to a micro brand, right? Uh, it just depends on what they what they really want. I I think that I am pretty well versed in micro brands, and I think that I can always argue a price for performance standpoint. And I know a lot of people have that you know that that same view in mind. Um, but ultimately, I mean, it just kind of depends on what people want. Uh, you know, I'm I'm pretty well versed with you know any other watch as well. I just took the time to learn micro brands and research them a lot yeah. so that's why I'm, I'm good at it but i would yeah. i would i would never suggest i mean again i'm here just as as a consultant i guess an advisor of my knowledge um is here for your disposal um but i would never at least for the first watch that somebody purchases ever tell somebody to buy a micro brand and I'm going to defend that. Shots fired. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, boom. Like, some people's heads are probably exploding now and getting ready to start trolling the hell out of me. But the reason why I say that is maybe I can walk it back a little bit. But if it's a watch that, like, you know, there's a, there's a lot. Watches are expensive. Let's, you know, say that. We probably don't even need to say that. But let's throw that out there. Um, and... Everybody, like, the tides come and go. Like, everybody's up. They can be up. They can be down. Whatever, you know. I mean, when, when you're down, times are hard, you know. And um, obviously, having a watch is not a necessity here. It's not a, you know, it's not a, a life-keeping, you know, in the 60s and 70s, people didn't have cell phones, right. you know. I it's mean, a tool. Yeah, it was, it was more of a tool then than it is now. Yes. I mean, if in general, but... You know, people don't rely on watches like they used to. So, you know, it, dying breed. <laughs> yeah, if you're if you're dropping eight hundred dollars, a thousand dollars on a watch, and you know, it's a micro brand, it's not going to be very easy to turn around and get your money back. Not that you're going to make money. I mean, again, I, I I will never suggest to buy a watch as an investment. Like that's not what I, I'll, you'll never hear me say that. Um, but even in the case of micro brands. They're hard to get your money back. If you bought your first watch and it was a Seiko or even a Citizen, a Timex, Bulova, whatever, right? A bigger box brand, um, you know, you could put those things on eBay or sell them on wherever, you know, and you could get your money back, you know, get something back pretty quickly versus a Kodak, Codex, whatever, or even a Fairer, sorry, Fairer, Um it's not going to move very quickly, you know, especially if you need your money back. Sure. You know, so that's my argument. That's the only argument I have about it. Um, <laughs> no, my. <laughs> yeah, go, please. <laughs> no, so, I mean, I see it as watches can definitely be a financial, um, 
you know, kind of agreement going into it is, do you want to keep your money? Do you want to make money? Do you want to lose money? You can definitely do any of those with watches. And micro brands, I would say, do not hold their value as much as more pre prestigious brands. Um, and that's okay. They've, they've kind of uh, turned to that over the years. I think that there are, you know, I'm, I'm not going to call it any names, but I think that there are manipulations within the market that some of these brands do to help upkeep their value. Um, for resale purposes and I think it can be a little weird sometimes um, I personally th this is coming from something just recent um, that, that I had I had gotten uh, a, a recent watch that I acquired a lot of people always ask that oh if you're gonna buy a watch it needs to be something that's really good really nice so when you pass it down and you know somebody else inherits it they're inheriting the wealth or the, you know the, the money that that watch can give or you know it's sentimental for me personally any watch is sentimental because i appreciate the the craftsmanship that goes into any of them right i just acquired a belova it was made in 1980 it's nothing crazy it's a 24 karat um plated gold it, you know it's rubbed off from over time um my papa is, is my grandfather um had given it to me um he's you know getting old and it, it was within his family and he gave it to me just out of you know hey i'm, I'm not going to wear this anymore we're not going to use it uh and for me getting that watch was, i i wasn't like man jackpot it's not a very expensive watch but i wasn't like jackpot man i acquired this and i can like get some money off this one day and i'm like take it to the jeweler and they're gonna melt it i'm like no dude like to me, it was the story of, like, where did this come from? How did I acquire it? Um, who loved it before me? Yeah. And that's that's kind of how I see watches. Is Ultimately, they are a tool, but they're all sentimental in their own way. Um, going back to my codec, there's a lot of people that will hate this. To me, it's sentimental. I know the story that went into creating it right. and kind of where it went, and it's no longer around. You can only buy them pre-owned. And there's something that's really unique to that for me. Uh, no matter the cost of the watch or, you know, how much it can be resold for. Now, don't get me wrong. There's always something nice to it. If you can resell a watch and you can make money, do I that. I don't do that. Like, I think I've only made money on, like, two... I don't even know if making money... I mean, I made money... I cleaned up on one watch. And it was a Speedmaster. Nice. Like... I literally, at the time, like, it was my first, I was like, okay, I want an Omega Speedmaster. Like, everybody grails over yeah, one. Great watches. Yeah, and I literally didn't know shit, and <laughs> I purchased one on eBay, and it was, it, I, I literally didn't know anything, and I was just like, ah, oh, cool, it's got the Speedmaster logo. Ended up being a Speedmaster Reduced. You know, and I was like, okay, these subdials are a little weird, but it's a Speedmaster, yep. <laughs> you know. And I guess the icon of a Speedmaster, like you know, you have that really tight cluster of subdials, and and it just I couldn't ever get over it. No, nope. and not to mention the bracelet, the way the bracelet was designed, it just looked weird. It the bracelet was good, like in terms of the like the look of it, but um, it scarred me. For, for years, I couldn't wear another bracelet because that was all I had known, really. And it was just a hair puller, you know? Yep. So I, I literally was like, okay, I, I could never wear it on the bracelet. Um, at the time when I got it, I think I paid around like 900 bucks or like a th just around 1000 for it. And then, you know, I imported it from Japan or whatever. And then I had to pay the custom fee. So I, maybe like $1,200 all in. Mm -hmm. $200 for the import, whatever, and, um, you know, then the market just blew up, you know, and uh, I think I ended up selling it for, like, I mean, 2000-ish. like pretty good. Like, 2300 yeah. 2400 somewhere around there, um, to a dealer who still was going to sell it for even more because it was a super clean example. Like, there was very little wear on no. it. Um but then I started doing research, you know, about it, and, and you know, you look into the movement, and mm -hmm. you know, like I care more about like keeping a watch, like like you just talked about, yeah. like keeping a watch through the generations, 
And in this specific case, like it was a thicker watch because it had a base movement and then it had a module on top of it. So anytime you would get it serviced, you know, you essentially had to take those two apart from my That's understanding right. and then service one and then service the other. And then the hairspring would come down from the module into the base of the movement. Um, if it works like that, I don't know, you know, that's my understanding of it, right? I'm not a, an engineer. A repair. <laughs> I'm not an engineer either, um, or a watch technician, but um, it was intimidating, and a lot of people didn't want to to service it, you know. So, yeah. again, talking about like the early stages here, um, I I just yeah, I just had to get rid of it, and then with the money that I made, I, I put it into a Speedmaster Professional. Yep which is the one that I have now, you know, manual winding. It's not automatic. Um, and, yeah, that, that's, that's my story. So, so yeah, cool story, bro. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, that was really the only one that I sold. And some of the other ones that I sold, like, I have, like, just lost my pants on. <laughs> you know, I'm not here to sell watches, but a buying principle that I follow is if you've been grailing over a watch forever, you know, and you can afford to pay the extra money, get it new, get that experience, get that relationship with the dealer. Um, if it's got an in-house caliber, you know, obviously it's something to, to know and be considerate of. Like, you know, you're not going to typically buy those watches in the gray market, you know, because then you're stuck dealing with, you know, that gray market dealer or, or whoever, um, getting it serviced, getting those, getting it back to the factory should you need it. And, and they, I, I don't know, I've heard people saying that their watches get, get confiscated. I don't even know how that could yeah, even work. Right. Like <laughs> you, you own that product and they're just like, no, I, this is my watch. You didn't buy this. Like we made this. We have the right to take this from you. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I've heard that. <laughs> That's but funky. I've, I've never had that happen or heard that. I mean, Hopefully I, it never does happen. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if it happens to some of you out there, like, please reach out. Like I would love to hear how that happened in your story. Um, but, but yeah, if you're, if you're going to keep it forever, buy it new, buy it from an AD, like, Hopefully you'll get a good deal on it if those still exist. You know, like ADs are kind of more reluctant now to to not give away watches, you know, and discount them. Sometimes I could be wrong. I mean, at least where I live, you know, it's hard to get discounts because people come here to act stupid. <laughs> um, but with that being said, I like to buy a lot of watches and I'm not sure about in pre-owned because the same as a car, you know, like that depreciation is going to happen. Um, and somebody took that hit for you, you know, again, I know I'm sounding like watches are investments here again, but, um, you know, so if I'm not sure if I'm going to hold it forever, if I'm not going to love it forever, I will buy it pre-owned. Yeah. Um, and there's something to be said, cause I have, I have fun weirdly enough. Like, obviously I, I, I there's no ever a question about it being, you know, an, uh, um, a forgery like a like a fake watch there's never any question about that i always buy from reputable secondhand dealers um and traders but um you know something fun about getting it in and it having like some blemishes on the case or whatever um like specifically i have a speedmaster mark ii that came in pretty recently i've only had it for four maybe three months now Four months, maybe. It was gone at service for a while. And um, I pretty much replaced everything with it. Like, I replaced all the hands. Um, I was trying to replace the dial. Um, I was trying to replace the pushers. Like, any type of wear. You know, I, I yeah. know people... Like, some of the guys at Omega that I was talking to, talking to, um, were kind of, like, just, like, hating on me for doing that. Because they're like, oh, the, the hands, you know, they were... It's not original. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're original factory hands, of course, right. but... not for that they're, watch, right. The dial has tritium, and now the hands are super Luminova, yeah. whatever. Um, but it's a watch that I personally love so much, and I, I, I can't ever see myself selling it. Yep. And that's actually, the, ironically, the eccentric watch I was talking about because of the case, but... Um, ultimately it comes down to if you love it, then love it. You know, it, it doesn't have to be anything more, you know, crazy than that. It's just, 
if you have a passion for watches and you love them, love what you get. You know, don't make a mistake of that. Don't buy into people telling you that you need to get something because they think that it's a good investment or you can make money off of it or they think it's the best watch in the world. If you don't like it, don't get it. Get stuff that you're interested in. If things need to be done to it and you want to give it love to continue loving it, then do so. There's nothing wrong with keeping up with things, you know, like that with watches. Um, wear and tear is always a thing that we deal with in our life. Yeah. Uh, on our homes, our cars, our bodies, our watches are no different. But don't ever be afraid to wear them and always love them. I, n- I know we're approaching, like, Oppenheimer length here, <laughs> you, you know, like, but... You had to drop the bomb, didn't you? <laughs> this is, yeah, this is a small film that we're coming into, but I, I still... This is our first one, so let's just make it special. Um, <laughs> we like talking. Yeah, I mean, I, I was trying to keep this a little shorter, but um, I don't feel like there's been any wasted opportunities here. But there's a few things that kind of I kind of wanted to to ask you before we wrap up. Um, you know, you talked about how you got your Bulova. I think it's an interesting story on how you got your Fairer, um, if you feel comfortable telling that. Um, and then, yeah, you know, maybe we could talk about where you see the industry going, like the micro brand segment, sure. um, or maybe even some advice for people who are looking to how to score their first micro brand watch, yeah. um, or maybe even things that you wish people understood about the micro brand industry. And then we could probably wrap up. Definitely. So, uh, we're still going to have a lot more to talk about at some point, too. Yeah. But yeah, this is, uh, once again, we like to talk. I know you guys probably like to listen. We're all about conversation, too. So Ho- hopefully. Yeah, if you guys ever want to, you know, reach out to us, then reach out. You know, we, we love talking about this stuff, and we're very passionate. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I can definitely thank Blake for a lot of my passions with watches. Um, he, he helped really push me into the world of it. Uh, I am fairly new into the watch world. Uh, I've probably been probably been into it for about the past six or seven years uh but nothing crazy um but yeah blake actually did help me acquire my fair uh whenever i first got into watches it was my first real watch that i had ever owned uh i had grew up wearing you know little sterlings and casios and things like that and i think maybe i had a spongebob watch back in the day yeah oh yeah (laughs) yeah nothing crazy crusty Uh, crab the crusty crab yeah (laughs) the pokemon special um but no, Blake uh, had helped get me my first, you know, the fair watch that we had spoken of earlier, my Ainsdale. Um, and I'll never sell that watch. It is it is forever ingrained in my heart because it was my wedding gift. Um, he had put together a, a group of, you know, some of my family and my close friends. And, um, you know, they decided to pitch in to help me get that first watch as, as a gift for me. Um, and, you know, my, the success of, you know, the wedding and everything. So, looking back, every day that I wear that watch, I'm always reminded of the people who helped me acquire it. And, you know, once again, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very, like, I'm a, I'm a passionate guy when it comes to watches. If something doesn't speak to me, I don't get it. But if something is given to me, uh, you know, along those lines, then I'm, I'm very appreciative. Uh, so, I can definitely thank Blake for getting me into being as passionate about watches as I am. Um, And we've had many, you know, late night conversations about this stuff too. But, um, I promise that wasn't a setup. (laughs) Yeah. I promise. Yeah. No, but it's going to make me cry. No, I'm just kidding. But no, I think, and so the, the strategy came where like wedding gifts are hard and I, I didn't really know. So like, I'm glad that we were able to work this out, but I was like, I'm the worst gift giver, like in the history of gift giving, (laughs) He so, gets you a box, and it's a box. Like, it's just a box. a box in a box, you know, with some... Here's some, an Amazon gift card. <laughs> pretty much. Uh, so if any of you guys want gifts from me, expect Amazon gift cards. <laughs> but um, but no, I just couldn't figure out what to do. And, you know, I noticed, like, there's a trend in cheesy wedding gifts. Like, I think people, like, oh, like, um, do you ever see the, uh, the movie? Um, I'm sure, obviously, you've seen it, Old School. Right, yeah. where um, the, the wedding happened, and and Will Ferrell's character like gave the wedding guy like a, a blender or something, <laughs> yeah. 
And then um, whenever he moves into his new house, he he comes back and he brings him like a new move-in house gift. Yep. And it's that same blender. <laughs> and he's like, oh, um, here's a, here's a move-in gift. And then he's like, oh, oh, oh. And he opens it and he's like, oh, that's the blender, the blender that I, I gave you. <laughs> and then he goes, oh, how are you liking me? He's like, oh, yeah, it's good, man. I like it, you know. Um, Full circle moment. <laughs> I, I thought about that and I was like, what? Like, is this is going to be the exact same thing that happens to me at Justin's wedding? Um, so we had this weird channel for his like bachelor party, um, and and yeah, you know there was a lot of chit chat about like what to do what would be the and, best thing, yeah, and how to facilitate this. And, and you had seen me obsess over getting that watch for yeah. Him two months at that point (laughs) yeah he made it easy because he was just like oh yeah and i i kind of like set him up yeah i was like oh like what what's your favorite of this from fairer you know what's your favorite watch um and i was like i think i actually i think i told him i was gonna buy one i think you did yeah (laughs) i think that was the set i was like oh shit i'm gonna buy one of these and like what what what, uh (laughs) what what do you think i should get yeah well like i need your feedback here i don't know it was it seemed organic and natural at the time it was but i didn't think anything of it yeah i'm not that i'm sketchy or anything yeah but i'm just i'm a i'm a help people out and not expect anything and it's it's cool whenever i you know people do kind of stick up for me and you know they're nice and give me things. I was I was very appreciative, but I had no idea. It was just like that's so cool. And it, it, I'm glad he listened. <laughs> and we we gave it to I think I think it's been a while now, but we gave it to you early mm-hmm. for the wedding. I actually came over to your house and you were like, "Here's your watch." And I was like, "What?" I don't even remember how all that whole <laughs> all that happened, yeah. but um, you had it shipped to you, so it didn't. I, I did come in my name. And, I did remember that because yeah. I remember it sitting on my um, my dining room table yeah. for like a little postcard with it and stuff. Yeah, yeah. for for like a couple days, um, but but no, I think we gave it to you early, and then I think. You wore it. I did on your wedding. Mm-hmm. Also, At your wedding, yeah, I wore it. Um, we got our pictures done. Uh, I'm, I'm originally from North Carolina. If I haven't said that um, already, uh, from the you know city of Raleigh, uh, so we got our pictures done in, in Raleigh, and uh, we walked around the you know the Capitol and some of the the older buildings and things like that, and got some really beautiful pictures done. And it was cool because within all those pictures, as corny as this sounds, I had the watch there. Yeah, you know, I was wearing it. <laughs> and it just completed the ensemble. I still go back and look at those pictures and I'm like, I remember being so giddy having that watch because I was standing like I was trying to pose in all these pictures and the photographer knew. She's like like we had told her like <laughs> I, this is like my wedding gift and she's like that's so cool so like she plans some of her shots to like accentuate like I got to watch, you know, like nothing nothing cliché or corny but like you know, certain positions, like, she she would get my wife, you know, standing on me and, like, have me touching her. And, like, the watch would be, like, in the shot or something. Right. And so kind of played into that. But That's so funny. It, I never, it was, like, the coolest thing, yeah. I never knew that, yep. that you told your photographer yep. to take wrist pics, yep. pretty much. Or it, it, it highlight your your timepiece. Like, yeah. That's so funny. Yeah, and, yeah. But I'm not a watch guy. Not at all, you know. No. No. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, so let's let's... I'm glad you were able to tell that story. I think it's a cool story. Um, That's one thing that I think is really important, you know, like having watches and sharing moments with them and then remembering like, you know, these, these things are like little time capsules, you know, like I guess, you know, and, um, so I feel like an asshole, like on the Speedmaster, because I was like, "All right, I like refurbished this watch, and it's not a time capsule anymore, even though it's from the '60s." You know, I, I think, or even jokingly, I, I, this is a weird transition back to that, but um, I got so much hate because I threw away the ha- the original hands. Oh no! Did you? I did. Oh no! Yeah, I know, bro. I know. Could have so, at least kept them in your pocket and used them. Well, as they were. No, I'm just kidding. I mean, they had radium on it. Yeah, you know, I was like, that, I don't know if I want. <laughs> you put that in the landfill. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I don't know where how they threw them. I get the watch. I just told the watchmaker. I was like, hey, just keep them. Like I don't know, but um, that's crazy. And I know it's not super toxic anymore, yeah. but I just was like, look, I'm. I want a new ish watch. Like these are going to be my stories to tell you know i mean it is cool that the movement and the caliber is still from the 60s but um 
got a facelift. Yeah, a yeah, bit. a little bit of Botox. Yeah, that's all right. You know. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Keep the things that are uh, drooping to stay from drooping. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sagging. <laughs> um, so, yeah, what – I don't think we talked about this one, but what what are some misconceptions and criticisms that you think – happen to micro specifically micro brands yeah i would say probably and we you know talked about this but i think the in-house movements is something that a lot of people really you know kind of qualm over like oh like we don't want that watch because it's not something that they made in their own you know manufacturing plant bro i don't care really don't they're, they're great watches either way um that's a big one um there are some some brands that fall into the you know, they, they don't push original boundaries and they do things that are almost duplicates in a way. Um, it's a very common practice as well as, you know, you, you get something started up and you create something that's always done well. You know, if, if you can't beat them, join them kind of mindset. Um, and I think that that happens to a lot and that, that puts taste, you know, bad taste in people's mouths. Um, not all of them, but there are a few out there. Uh, I would say that that's a big one as well. Um, and then that, and you know, like, like Blake said, you know, there's, there's a there's a sense of accountability and prestige and things that you get with some of these nicer watches. You've got serialized numbers. You know, there's only certain ones in the world. There's, you know, all, all these things, certificates and things that you can get, proof of purchases. Some of that is not relevant with micro brands. It's just, oh, you, you buy a watch and it's a good watch and here's your number of watch and have a good day. Like, you don't have that. You know that that back end, um, you know, kind of praise that you get from other brands. Um, I, I think probably say that's really it. But I mean, yeah. What do you have? I'm, I think I think people should normalize choosing your serial number. Like I think so too. Like that's so cool. I, I think so too. Yeah, that that's something that uh, some brands do as well. Is you can you can choose what you know serial number or, or which um, normalize it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which manufacturer model you you got from that that watch and. It's such a cool thing, you know, and, uh, you know, first thing comes to mind, everybody wants the, the one, one, ones and the two, two, twos and the three, three, threes and the, and the 69s and you know, <laughs> people have their own 89s, you know, 80, yeah, 89 if you want 42s. That's the, uh, the number of life, you know, so <laughs> the number of life. I thought it was eight. <laughs> no, 42. I know like a lot of people like eights because eight is infinite. Yep. So like eight, eight, eight or yeah. one, eight, eight, eight or what? Eight, eight or zero, zero, eight or what? You know, like but... two, three hundred empire <laughs> yeah. today. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there, hundred. there's, yeah, there's all sorts of reasoning, but yeah, I mean that, that's something that I wish more people would do as well. It, oh, it adds just that little sense of this is mine on it personalization without paying for personalization that's right um just like that domino's rolex that we saw the other day oh yeah <laughs> just a nice little touch man if you if you ever wanted to go in and just you know buy a buy a pre-owned rolex and then you look on the back and it has a domino's logo so it yeah. also if you had some sort of attachment to domino's then <laughs> they also <laughs> drilled a little like emblem into yep. the the bracelet yep. and so there's a huge hole in the bracelet <laughs> it's well, unique that's for sure <laughs> I, yeah i mean if somebody clearly has doesn't like dominoes as much as he used to i love dominoes i love that watch yeah get you one of them garlic crusted watches <laughs> um but so so again i guess we got to leave kind of on a high note um where where do you see the market for micro brands going i mean um, I think that personally, this is a great time for, um, people to pioneer their own ways. I think that micro brands are becoming a norm. Clearly you're seeing that within the market, within people who represent the market, uh, famous YouTubers, bloggers, all sorts of stuff. I think that people are really pushing for what micro brands stand for. Um, they're not just a cash grab. Some people think that like they're cheap and you know, they're not worth it. I think that in every sense, they can be very worth it. Um, so I think that people are understanding that and are shopping smarter. Uh, you know, we have access to the internet and we're able to research and talk and things Definitely. like that, communicate about these things. Yeah. And I just think that time will, you know, continue to kind of push that the micro brand market forward. Um, not to say that 
it's going to you know impact some of your your larger um, manufacturers and brands as much. You know, maybe it has already. I, I couldn't tell you that. I don't have insight into that. Definitely, but it has. I yeah, think. yeah. But I, I think that it's going to grow um, more and more, and I just don't want for it to get to the point where it becomes same. Everything becomes the same trend. I want for micro brands to stay in their own path and to be unique within their own realm. I think they will. I hope. I, that's why they, you know when we were talking earlier like they have their own you know they don't have the, they don't have the same resources they don't you know yeah. so I mean they have no choice but to listen yeah you know? and I mean there's already micro brands that are doing titanium cases Definitely. and um, enamel dials we were talking about that the other day yeah I mean the, there's all these practices that you know these really prestigious brands have been using for hundred you know two hundred years. That some of these micro brands are doing phenomenally and they're pulling it off well and they're making waves and as long as they can keep pushing those boundaries and doing that but but you know keeping their cost in mind keeping their audience in mind then i think that it'll continue to grow i think so too like i think that's a great point like it exists because of them of big brands not listening to their customers i said that's that right. already here on this podcast but as long as the micro brands continue to listen like it, the market share for micro brands just continue to grow, and you know price is not necessarily any more a, um, a justification of value, right. you know, of quality. You know, right. um, you can get a good ass watch for five hundred dollars, three hundred dollars. Right. I mean, look at Hamilton. You, you, that's not even a micro brand, yeah. but you know, yeah. I mean, I, I love my khaki. Yeah. You know, it's a great watch. He's not um, talking about his pants. No, no. Jake um, from State Farm. <laughs> pretty much. Blake from State Farm. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. And then what advice would you give somebody? I mean, I know I've already pushed back on this, but to consider their first micro brand watch, help us navigate it, help us break it down, thoughts, considerations, um, and then we'll leave at that. Yeah. Um, I, like I said earlier, I will always preface with buy something that you love. Um, don't listen to what anybody tells you unless of course you trust their opinion and you know, they're leading you down the right path, but buy something that you love. Um, be a smart shopper. We have, you know, internet and resources and things where we can research and, um, you know, kind of see what you can afford for what you want Go down that path, you know, put time into it, uh, and don't impulse buy things. I'm personally not an impulse buyer. I uh, never really have been. I think that's helped me with the trajectory of how much research I've done on this, which has also given me credibility into what I know about this stuff is because I've just looked it up. And yeah, sure, I haven't bought as much as what I could have, yeah. but it's helped me to be a smart shopper and to know what I want. <laughs> so I would say um, buy what you love, do your research, um, and honestly, yeah, I mean, you use Google. You use people that you 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 know. You know, look up your top micro brand uh, brands. See what other people are saying. Um, that's honestly the best advice that I can give because that's a lot of what I've done. Yeah. Um, pretty much the exact opposite of how I buy a watch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, and everybody's different, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'll buy a watch and then I'll be like, oh, let me research this. Yep. yep. <laughs> The um and I mean one of the toughest things and we haven't even touched on this and I'll you know I'll be short because I know we're trying to wrap up. Uh, one of the big things is a lot of these micro brands you can't really buy in store. So yeah, I know that we could talk about this some other time, but um you don't get a lot of that you know that feeling of oh you come in and you try it on and you love it and you fall in love with it because it gets wrist time. It's just like oh like I love the look of that and I really hope it fits. Right, that's kind of your your mindset. Yeah. Um, and thankfully there's many brands that you know they'll have good illustrations or oh you know this is so and so length and you just have to be smart about it once again you know just don't bite on impulse and know what you're getting into um look at reviews and things like that and you know it'll, it'll help you make a smart purchase and you know you'll get something that you like so. yeah i mean i don't want to plug anything here but i think that's a good plug for like even like the wind up yeah. stuff yeah. you know like the wind up watch fair like they get 
they have so much pull with these micro brands that they it's, I think it's fantastic that they do that stuff. They give people the opportunity yep. to try before you buy. You'll meet some cool people. You'll find some brands that you've never even heard of before. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there, there's all sorts of you know pros to those um, festivals and things that they host. Um, and like you said, you had just went to the last one, and um, you know he developed his own op- opinions about some micro brands. And I know you had mentioned Baltic earlier. Yeah, Baltic's fantastic. I I had pitched them onto Blake a while back, and he had never really considered it. He's like, man, yeah, I'll, I'll have to look into those. So. Sure enough, when he went to wind up, yeah. he went right over to the booth and was like, "Bro, you were I, right. Like these are nice." There, there were other brands that I went there to see. There was like five or six, and I had consulted Justin. I was like, "Hey, here's the brands that I'm here to see." <laughs> um, and I went there, and some of the watches were just very underwhelming. Yeah, like I, I just the price was right. You know, they just. I, I had it in my mind. I was like ninety nine percent sure that I was going to buy this watch from this brand. Not talking about Baltic, and then I went around to everything, and um, I particularly wanted to buy something like on location, yep. and um, and you came up with your own conclusions about what you liked and what you thought was worth it. Right. Yep. I mean, I got the watch in my hands. Um, it was actually one of the watches that they had on in their showcase. They didn't have any inventory to sell. I think they had a couple pieces. I, I could be wrong, but they're like, it was a GMT with the green. It's like a green and blue. blue kind of like green. a teal and blue. Yeah, yeah something. The bezel. Um, and they only had that one, you know, because apparently they were sold out or back, backed up or whatever. But I ended up buying the actual piece that they had on display. So... I'm sure my watch has probably been photographed, like, because at the time, you know, there was a bunch of little, like, press events that had happened, yeah. and, um, and, and yeah, so I ended up just buying one that was right on the showcase, you know, from them, and I, and I took it home, and I got three straps with it, you know, so that way I could have a little bit of fun and a little bit of flavor. And you love it. I do love it. Yeah. Um, it's a good watch. I don't wear it very much. Well, because you've got 20,000 other watches. Yeah. Scratch that off the record. <laughs> and that, that's a problem, but um, it still has a significant place, yeah. I think, in my collection, even though I don't wear it. Um, and it's hard. Like, it's hard as a collector. And, and this is, again, a problem that I face. Even if you have endless money, I don't, but obviously, if you have been collecting for a long time and you never sell your watches, you're going to fall out of love with certain pieces and your collection is going to grow, you know, to a place where you can't maintain it. And that's where I'm at. That's where I, like, I can't, I have to get rid of three watches to buy one, you know, because it's never going to be, once you buy a new watch, something else falls out of rotation, you know, and realistically you can only rotate, I'd say probably comfortably five seven maybe even ten watches depending on your your Style, lifestyle your taste. wardrobe mm-hmm. yeah i mean i don't know what what they do yeah right. purpose utility mm-hmm. but um but you can really only rotate five to ten watches i've i've noticed like in Agreed. in your rotation and uh and so yeah it's just not something i grab very often but on on paper like it's a perfect watch yeah you know yeah, for it's a very nice watch for me yeah. um it's cheap, but travels well. It's yep. a small watch. It's, I think, a 39 millimeter. It kills it. Yep. It's and, definitely a nice watch. And it's good quality, you know. So And I got it, you know, at, 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 at an event, you know. Yeah. So I took my wife to San Francisco for the first time. And, <laughs> and yeah, so. But once again, you know, you're, you're used to that, you know, walking into a watch shop. Right. Speaking with a representative, getting your hands on something, putting it on. And kind of making your decision that way, and yeah, I think that that's that's just the big knock on a lot of micro brands right now is it's mainly online. You know, you can't really get that, you know, that effect experience. Yeah, you just don't go into a store and oh, there's a there's a fair right there. Let me pick that up and put it on. It just doesn't happen. So. Distribution is definitely harder. It is for them. So um, support the little guys though. They're they're making waves. <laughs> they definitely make cool watches. Um, Wow, one hour and 30, almost 30 minutes here. 
I mean, once we add a little like intro, hey, outro, that's an intermission for Oppenheimer. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is half of Oppenheimer. <laughs> um, definitely not as epic. Um, but thanks for listening. Yeah, hope, hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Um, do all the social stuff like like, subscribe, share, whatever. Um, thank you for supporting us. Yeah, and thank contact you. us. We we would love to hear from you guys as well. Clearly, this is something that we're very passionate about, um, and you know we would love to hear from each and every one of you guys on, you know what we can do better, uh, how we did, uh, you know what your favorite watch is, um, you know things like that. You know, talk with us, and we, we'd love to talk to you guys back. Yeah, at the, at this stage right now and our size, I mean, we're able to to address all of you. I, ho- I hope to, we grow to the size where we. Can still address all of you but um i want to build like that's that's the whole goal for the website right like to 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 build a community like to to em, to empower everybody like everybody who likes watches on the internet kind of sucks you know i mean <laughs> damn i just crushed everybody who's listening <laughs> but but no i mean it's it can be a welcoming community but not always, you know. Um, I mean, let's just face it. We're trolls. You know, <laughs> we're living trolls. Um, and we're super opinionated, you know. And we love to, to jump on, you know, somebody that's down, you know. If they're wearing a trashy watch, <laughs> you know. Um, a fashion watch. Uh but um but no no I, I i don't i've seen it i don't believe in it it's not me i don't care it's your money um but the goal here in the long term is to have the brand the identity all be powered by you you know like i've told justin and we talked about this multiple times but i don't want sponsors so if you're trying to approach me for a watch review or whatever i don't sell watches i don't sell watches i am not incentivized in any way by talking about this or that um i don't want advertisers on our website i say that but i think in the future for our model should it be sustainable um because if it's not sustainable i'm just gonna die on my high hill um that we're all subscriber funded you know you you we're gonna give away a ton of value a ton of content um you know we're gonna thrive on donations um i don't even know if we're gonna do pay for access really you know like we're gonna survive hopefully we're gonna be a charity (laughs) let's put it like that like we're gonna be that homeless dude that's begging you for five dollars at the stoplight (laughs) but hopefully not as annoying i don't know i hope not (laughs) i mean we're definitely not gonna use the money for drugs or anything wink wink you know um but but no a hundred percent of what what happens is going to go back into the brand. Um, you know, I, I want to, to give away things like, you know, as long as we're able to pay the web hosting and, um, and I mean, I don't know, pay for some, some of the donations. I mean, we're already talking about, I've already gotten a good amount of donations, you know, which has been cool considering we haven't even really been launched for two weeks yet. Um, but I've already gotten, you know, hundreds of dollars, you know, um, in donations that, you know, for the longest, we just had a, a splash page that was just like, hey, donate. And not even telling people why, you know. <laughs> so that's a good start. But we're already talking about, um, you know, using that to to buy stuff, you know. And, and I want to give shit away, you know. Like I want to. The goal is for people, depending on you know how you how you donate, how you support us, is what you benefit from. You know, and nothing makes me happier than to just support people. 
um, you know, with, with obtaining their own watches uh, for their personal needs. I, I love that sort of stuff because um, it makes me happy. You know, it makes me makes me feel good to know that I influence somebody to do something that they love and pursue a passion. Um, and I've always been that way with, with anything. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I, I definitely, I, I agree that, you know, I, I want for everybody to, you know, pitch in and, and have these conversations and to open up um, and to assist us. You know, we want to be here for you guys to help you grow, to help you make the best buying decisions that you can, um, to help, you know, be a, a bigger part of your community and to go to local events and, you know, really pursue everything that you can, uh, you know, with watches because we're in the same boat. We're very passionate. Um, yeah. That's so, something too, like if you guys start noticing some of the things, like this is not a plug, like and in any way, um, but even if you go to other blogs, like you have sponsored writer, you know, like it'll it'll be like a plug for the writer, you know, like credit, um, like you don't find that our, on our blog, you know, for good reason. It's not about who wrote the article; it's about the content, you know. And I would like to think it's alternative content. I could be wrong. Um, but, but it's never about one person, you know, it's about all of us and, and hopefully we're here to stay, but, but if not, we're getting supported right now. Yeah. So what's your takeaway, Blake? I don't really have one. Okay. <laughs> this, um, I've got a question for you. Yeah. We'll end on this and we can ask anybody as well if they want to answer this. Yeah. What watch do you want to be buried with? Of course, if you believe in being buried, because <laughs> I know everybody's different. What is the one watch? Holy shit. That's <laughs> deep. It's life or death. No pun intended. <laughs> I think, I think it would probably change. Like if you ask me this now and then it's next different. week. Yep. Um, uh, this is going to be such a cliche one, but and I, I probably will feel like this, but my Speedmaster just came back from service. Um, it's still under warranty. It's a newer Speedmaster. I mean, it's a five-year warranty. It's two years old, whatever. Just came back from Omega. And despite having over 80 watches at my house, um, it still didn't feel right with that watch being not there. Okay. You know, I got married in it. Um, it was my first big boy, yeah. if you can call it that, big boy watch. Um, and I just remember just working so hard and saving, you know, like I'm not, I, I, back then I wasn't able to buy watches at the rate that I do now. Um, but I just remember like busting my ass and I was an Uber driver. I was just driving Uber like nonstop, you know, to buy that thing. I would just put put a 12 hour day in and they uber would cut me off the app um because i was there like safety concerns because i was driving for so long yeah. um and and yeah so that watch bought it from a dealer um it was the time when the new ones had just came out and the old ones were you know were being phased out and i, I intentionally searched for a last generation speedmaster because that was like in my eyes one of the ogs like the the design language didn't change for a really long time it was like from 1997 until i think 2020 2019 somewhere around there um it yeah it's just such an og it's to me um so yeah I, I i definitely want to sell it um I probably will I don't know if I get buried with it because it might that story is gonna mean something to to my family, immediate family or friends or children or so, who knows, yeah. right? Not at this at this point, but <laughs> um I think the one that's the one that means the most. What about you? My SpongeBob watch. <laughs> really? Plastic. That'll last forever, baby. <laughs> yeah. 
It's going to become biodegradable. Takes me back to a simpler time yeah. where it all started. Okay. <laughs> all right. He has a sponge. He has a bunch of SpongeBob shirts. Yeah. I'm a child at heart. Leave me alone. Yeah. Anyways. Well, so now we have something for people to comment about. Again, if you were to get buried with a watch, what would it be? Hopefully that's not a dark one. <laughs> but um, but no, we're genuinely curious. Um, yeah, so what we need we need a slogan. I've been saying like never have a lonely wrist, but that sounds kind of stupid. <laughs> um so we need to end it with a slogan, right? That's what they do during these things. Or we can just cut it mid Just cut. Bye. Bye. <laughs> like, no. The podcast ends now. But it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> you should totally cut it. <laughs> yeah. We, we're, okay, okay, guys. That's episode two, guys. We'll come up with that later. Yeah, we're, we're going into episode two right yep. now. Oppenheimer no. Pack back up yeah no uh, one minute one not one minute one hour and 40 minutes Sheesh. of you listening to us right. i'm gonna go drink some water i know my throat is rasping. drink water guys stay hydrated stay hydrated Take care. that's what we're ending on <laughs> see you guys till the next time